Today's video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform to build your brand, grow your business, or pursue your passion. It's Greg B. Harrell here with Halsey. <laughs> I bet the view count just spiked. Hi. Okay. Hello, class. Can you tell I have a new camera and I'm very excited about it? Today, we are talking about everyone's favorite blue-haired pop star with pronouns, Halsey. And I am saying that with love, just to be clear. I, for one, am very excited to go through Halsey's career because I have this very vivid memory of when I was like 16, 17. I came across a Halsey performance and for some reason this concert was shot in 4K, like incredible video quality for 2015. Back in a time when everyone's Instagram looked like this, I really don't know how they did it, but I was just entranced by this blue-haired liberal. I had never heard of Halsey before, but I just started obsessively going through every live performance I could find of them at the time, and I discovered, oh my gosh, their debut album is about to drop in like a month. I'm really here on the ground floor, even though, uh, as we'll get into, Halsey was already what, internet famous long before I discovered who they were. But let's pretend for a second that I was cool and unique and I found them first before you did. I'm cooler. Halsey is just a very interesting figure that's kind of hard to summarize chronologically. Because for one, even though Halsey has some of the most successful songs, like period, Closer, Without Me, Halsey isn't really viewed as like a household pop star name. They've always seemed to exist as like a Tumblr adjacent figure. And with that comes a lot of debate, not necessarily over any particular controversy or Halsey moment that they have, but just over whether we like Halsey as a musician, as a person. As many of you may know, Halsey is probably most infamous for their cursive singing and sometimes it's a vibe and other times it really isn't. And Halsey's public persona also just generates strong reactions for people. For some, that's because they relate to Halsey. They admire their social justice work. They too want to live their Tumblr YN life or it is the exact opposite. And people think Halsey is an industry plant, pretentious, inauthentic, just, you know, the worst things that a femme pop star can be. And of course, any public figure's likability to mass audiences is gonna be important to their career. And no public figure is for everyone, but it really does seem like so much of Halsey as a public figure, as a celebrity, does come down to whether or not you like their personality. No matter which side you fall on, you have strong opinions. And so as we go through different notable moments in Halsey's life and career, this debate over whether or not Halsey can hang is just always going to be an extra footnote that you just need to be constantly taking into account. And of course, whether or not you do like Halsey or not is going to dramatically change your perception of these moments. Halsey, or Ashley Nicolette Frangipani, was born on September 29th, 1994 to Nicolette and Chris Frangipani. Their parents were young and dropped out of college when they learned that Nicole was pregnant. Because Halsey's parents worked a lot of different jobs and often struggled to afford rent, Halsey grew up moving from apartment to apartment as a kid in New Jersey. She has two younger brothers and attended six schools by the time that she was a teen. At the age of four, Halsey's grandma started teaching her how to play the piano with sheet music from the hit music cats. He follows me everywhere. When Halsey was in middle school, she wanted to learn how to play the violin, but at the time her parents could only afford a used viola. So they found an instructor that taught Halsey how to play the violin on the viola until they could afford to get her a violin. So she does technically also know how to play the viola, just not really correctly. They also learned how to play the cello and the guitar and started posting covers to MySpace, YouTube, and Keek. Your life, your voice, your reason to be. I got my ticket for the long way round. To buy whiskey for the way. Hi guys, I just ate so okay. many french fries, it's 
ridiculous, actually. By age 14, Halsey had 14,000 MySpace friends, and by 18, they had 16,000 subscribers on YouTube and over 10,000 followers on Tumblr. Although Halsey originally wanted to be like a writer or a poet when they grew up, music was by far just their most successful thing when they were younger, and it was the thing that people connected to, and it became a way for her to show her poetry in an accessible form. I feel like I've said this now about multiple celebrities, so perhaps it's lost its meaning, but I mean it this time. Halsey didn't ask to be that Tumblr girl. She just was. Doesn't this just want to make you play AM on your criminally cheap record player, put on some high-waisted shorts and tights, and just forget all of your troubles? Now, of course, Halsey wasn't just posting artsy poetry or soft grunge inspo. Actually, in 2013, Halsey's biggest claim to fame was being a One Direction stan account. When the infamous Hailer picks in Central Park dropped. We all remember where we were, and the fandom was shattered. But Ashley Frangipani wrote a song which has tragically been mostly scrubbed from the internet, but was the voice of the nation. I don't know how much of this clip I'll actually get to show. I will link the full video of this below and I, I recommend y'all watch it. But just in case this part gets copyright claimed and I can't show it, the lyrics include, we knew she was trouble when she got styles. So shame on us now, this fandom's getting kind of hostile. She's gonna put him in her ex-boy pile. Oh, oh. Trouble, trouble. I mean, you might as well be watching the original thing. That was an incredible rendition. This is meant to be a parody, but when she stops singing her little song, honestly, it feels like there's some real anger there. Trouble, trouble. Seriously, fuck this Taylor bullshit. But don't worry, Halsey has grown since this time. She's come around to Taylor Swift. They've since performed together. Halsey publicly called out Scooter Braun when he bought her masters. Halsey has gotten with the times. Taylor doesn't need any protecting by any means. Um, but, she, you know, I wanted to make sure that she knew and that the rest of the world knew that what was happening was it just isn't right. Yeah. Right. And I'm not going to sit and let that happen. Um, I relate to her as a woman. I relate to her as a writer, as an artist. Um, and it was really important for me to speak up because I would I would have hoped that someone would have done it for me too. Although Halsey is still friends with John Mayer. Um, we can't win them all, I guess. And I love interviews about this Haler song and this like 1D era of Halsey's life because she honestly seems kind of embarrassed and like that she hates that like a digital footprint exists and she super downplays it. Like she'll say, I made multiple parody videos at that age. I'm quick witted, clever and kind of an asshole. And it was how I handled that when I was 16. Halsey was 18 when they made that video, but I mean, who's counting? She also said, I understand it was a pack mentality. And knowing that in stirring up that discourse, we would all be on the same side about it, which is exactly what people do to me now. When you hate someone's girlfriend or brother or hate another band, that's a gang mentality. People would rather talk together about something they hate than something they all love. That's so blatantly clear in our nation at the moment. People in political parties are stands. They sit online, they wait to see anyone who's going to say something bad about their favorite, and they fucking trash them. They direct hate at any opposer. The political parties have literally turned into fandoms. I mean, you heard it from Halsey first. BTS ARMY? Mitch McConnell? Same thing. But this wasn't even the only song Halsey wrote about Haler. There's also this original song, SOS. SOS is about how Harry is with Taylor, but he would be so much happier with someone, say, who had like blue hair and was on Tumblr and was really artsy and cool and was named Ashley Frangipani. I get it. She's tall and she's pretty and she's blonde and she can write one hell of a breakup song, but she'll never love you like I could. And in Halsey's defense, she didn't just use her fandom power to thirst over Harry Styles. She also released an original song called for Ruby as a fundraiser for a five-year-old girl with brain cancer. She said her body held a monster and she needs help trying to fight it. She knew it when he crossed her that it was wrong but she could write it. This song raised $45,000 for the Donna Louise Children's Fund. It's not often you hear of good things coming from Tumblr, so we just have to hold on to it and appreciate it. Halsey's Tumblr is technically still accessible on the Wayback Machine. It, she's password protected, basically all of the juicy stuff that had like her poetry or any asks that had like personal stuff about her. But you know what posts I did find on her Tumblr that are still accessible to the public? Pictures of Halsey, well, Ashley, with short pink hair at a certain mall in Philadelphia. That's right, the iconic 
mall performance. Halsey, or Ashley, met up with some of her Tumblr fans or friends at the time, and in fairness to her, this was her first time singing in front of people, and her voice is just like shaking from nerves. Hey, don't forget the lyrics, because I've been forgetting the lyrics of songs I've heard a million times, like James Dean, and I'm sorry, place in my head, but I just forgot the lyrics. No, yeah. All right, you guys want to sing with me? You guys are making me sing, like, you guys could totally sing with me. It's Blink-182, every You're not Blink-182. <laughs> Guys, <laughs> Alright. Where are you? And I'm so sorry. I cannot sleep, I cannot dream tonight. I need somebody in all ways. This extreme darkness comes creeping in. So haunting every time Like as I stare I counted The webs from all the spiders Catching things that eat in their insights Like indecision to call you And hear your voice over reason Will you come home and stop this pain tonight? Just stop this pain tonight Don't waste your time for me You're already the voice inside my This wasn't like when Halsey was an actual celebrity. This is really just a teenage girl uh, singing at the mall, putting herself out there. So does it make me a bad person for chuckling at this teenage girl doing her best? Uh, probably. Where are you? I'm so sorry. But even though Halsey was seemingly living their Tumblr YN life online, things were not so easy offline. When Halsey was 17, they started dating a 24-year-old man who was addicted to very hard drugs. Halsey would go up to visit this man on Halsey Street in Brooklyn, New York. And as you can probably guess, this wasn't the healthiest relationship and kind of sent Halsey down a bad path with addiction and also just toxic, unhealthy relationships. Also, although Halsey was accepted to the Rhode Island School of Design, which is not an easy school to get into, by the way. They couldn't afford to go. Halsey enrolled in community college, but dropped out shortly after. This led to a lot of disagreements with her parents until they eventually kicked her out. She was basically couch surfing for months on end. Halsey said, I remember one time I had $9 in my bank account and bought a four pack of Red Bull and used it to stay up overnight over the course of two or three days because it was less dangerous to not sleep than it was to sleep somewhere random and maybe get R-worded or kidnapped. And would you be surprised that some people online in their Tumblr community did not believe that Halsey was homeless? According to Halsey, people would say, how could you be homeless? You were a One Direction fan. It's like, can't you be both? Well, no, Halsey, everyone knows that as a Directioner, you do get free universal housing because One Direction has bought you from your parents. That's kind of the whole deal, like it's part of your initiation as a Directioner. It's true, look it up. Don't look it up. But it was during this horrible time in her life that she started making music. One night, Halsey was invited to an exclusive party at a Holiday Inn in Newark. Halsey said, I figured hotel party equals bed. I needed a bed. The story goes that at this party, there was a music guy who had seen a video of Halsey singing one of their original songs on YouTube. I like to imagine that it was SOS, but we don't know. The music guy introduced Halsey to another music guy who invited Halsey to record the song in his basement. Studio. There was a studio in his basement. With this music guy, Halsey wrote what would become their debut single, Ghost. One night in February of 2014, Halsey uploaded Ghost to SoundCloud and overnight, the song began to chart. Halsey was immediately approached by multiple record labels, but they ended up signing with a small boutique electronic DJ label called Astralworks. And this is also when they officially became Halsey. As I mentioned earlier, Halsey Street was a spot very important to Ashley at that time, and it also just so happens to be an anagram of their much lamer birth name, Ashley. Can you imagine if Halsey was just Ashley? I mean, blech, you know? But if you weren't familiar with Halsey's Tumblr persona before Ghost was published, it might seem like, sir? It might seem like Halsey came from nowhere, and even to this day, there's a lot of speculation as to whether Halsey is an industry plant, because the story of an unhoused internet celeb to major pop star overnight is a pretty crazy 
transformation, especially devoid of context. And there's some very uncomfortable speculation on whether Halsey was really unhoused, whether Halsey was really not welcome at her parents' homes, because people will see, oh, Halsey took pictures with their parents during this time. So clearly their relationship was fine. And like, that's the kind of speculation we're just like not gonna do over here. I suppose it is possible that this story, specifically the story of Halsey getting discovered through SoundCloud, is exaggerated. Maybe Halsey was signed with this label just before Ghost dropped on SoundCloud and then they tried to generate hype more artificially. But I personally think the story is mostly true. I mean, yes, having an overnight charting song just from SoundCloud is crazy, but Halsey did already have a pretty substantial audience. They had tens of thousands of active followers on different social media, and so there's already going to be some engagement with her music. It's not just like totally starting from nowhere. Halsey was also friends with the guys from Five Sauce before they blew up, and so by the time Halsey posted Ghost on Twitter, Five Sauce was huge, and Five Sauce fans were also noticing Halsey's music and spreading it around. It's also just like a really catchy song, so what are you going to do? It's a bop. I also think that if Halsey was a true industry plant, they would have signed a better record deal than the one that they did sign. The initial deal was only for $100,000 because Halsey was a streaming-based, internet-based artist in a time when streaming music was not the main way the music industry made money. And to be perfectly clear, $100,000 for an unhoused person is a life-changing amount of money. But that amount of money to produce a major mainstream album is not a lot. Halsey basically had to cover the cost of styling and promoting themselves outside of actually producing the music. Halsey did their own makeup. Their clothes all look like something an 18-year-old could get on their own. Some of Halsey's early wigs are just like criminally <laughs> shiny and like unstyled. Halsey's early indie sleaze vibe is a lot more believable to me than like the tramp stamps from TikTok, you know? But maybe they just did a better job covering up their tracks. I, I guess we'll never know. So Halsey released their EP Room 93 with four songs, including their hit single Ghost. But of course, the main event, at least for me personally, was the release of their first album, Badlands, in 2015. Are you insane like me? Been in pain like me? When I tell you just the utter delusion that this album gave me, I thought I was so cool listening to this album. And that's not to say that the album itself isn't cool. It is, but it was just so powerful. It ended up transferring this absolutely unearned Tumblr YN ego in me. This album made me exhausting to be around, and I love it. The debut music video for Badlands was also a re-release of Ghosts. This time, it featured Halsey with a female love interest, which for 2015 as a new pop artist is pretty wild. It's also an homage to Lost in Translation, which at the time raised concerns that Halsey was possibly fetishizing Japanese culture. And something I did not realize was that Halsey did release a Japanese edition of Badlands, which I can't tell if that means it was like only sold in Japan or if it just had Japanese lettering on the front of it and that's what made it the Japanese album and I don't know why that decision was made. Was Halsey super big in Japan? I, I just have some questions. Before we continue, a brief word about today's sponsor, Squarespace. Like many people, I saw iCarly back in the day and I thought I could do that and so I created my own website called Pi Always Rock dot com because we all thought Pi was a really funny thing in 2009 for some reason. And would you believe that that blog didn't take off? But I am so happy to have the opportunity with today's sponsor to finally relaunch my blog era with a more mature, um, high art concept. Pictures of Goose dot com. Squarespace has countless beautiful templates that you can pick from all to suit your needs. I was able to put in this beautiful gallery just displaying Goose. I mean, I told you this website's about Goose. And this process could not have been easier thanks to Squarespace's asset library. I was able to upload everything I wanted from my website onto one central organized hub and use it all throughout my website. With Squarespace's Fluid Engine design system, you're able to take these pre-made templates, which already look great, and then customize them to match your brand. You really can customize every design detail with their reimagined drag and drop technology for desktop or mobile. So for example, not only do I have a beautiful display of pictures of Goose, I was also able to put some testimonials of various real people who have interacted with Goose. So whether you want to build a business, have a blog, or you know, also, you can post pictures of Goose too if you want. Squarespace is the place to do it. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com 
squarespace.com slash Ashley Norton for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Be sure to check out my pictures of Goose and let's get back to it. If Halsey hasn't already proven their ultimate Tumblr girl credentials, Halsey also started dating Ashton Irwin of Five Seconds of Summer and then Maddie Healy of The1975, and it's speculated that these relationships were major inspiration for the music on Room 93 and Badlands. What's really funny about this is even though Halsey was somewhat Tumblr famous, there isn't the same hierarchy with Tumblr fame as there is with like other types of internet fame. Even if you have like 10,000 followers on Tumblr, you're still just like some person on Tumblr. And so Halsey was just like some girl named Ashley to a lot of people. Not the just Ashley like Taylor Swift impersonator or me a girl named Ashley, a, a different girl named Ashley. So like when Halsey was spotted with Ashton Irwin from Five Seconds of Summer, people on Tumblr are just like, oh my God, is that Ashley? The One Direction Stan account dating this Tumblr heartthrob? Like, what is happening? <laughs> Unfortunately, this era really doesn't seem to have been archived very well, but from what I could find, it does kind of seem like a lot of Tumblr girls started hating Halsey simply because she was dating the Tumblr boys that everyone wanted to date. I found at least one post going to lengths to explain why Halsey was such a monster in her Tumblr days. People around this time just really started to hate for one of two reasons. A, she was f***ing Maddie, or B, she was f***ing great at bragging about the possibility that she did Maddie. That's when people just, people weren't happy. They weren't happy because she was rubbing it in everyone's faces and she was being annoying about it. If she was him, why wouldn't she keep that on the down low? Why would she post all of this stuff on social media? Why would she f***ing pull any of this sh At the time, people from the 1D 5 sauce fandom were all just like, well, she's at it again. <laughs> the horror. <laughs> Halsey and Maddie Healy have never really confirmed their relationship, but there are plenty of pictures of them together from this time, and it's like all but confirmed. There are rumors that Halsey's first EP, Room 93, was produced with 1975's help, and the Room 93 in question was a hotel room that she shared with Maddie Healy. Also, before releasing their music, Halsey had posted um, some poetry about Maddie Healy. Poetry which I... Do not feel comfortable reading out to you all. But their Maddie Healy poetry was not all erotic in nature. She also posted this poem to her blog. You were red and you liked me because I was blue. But you touched me and suddenly I was a lilac sky and you decided purple just wasn't for you. Seem familiar? When Halsey released her song Colors, one of her absolute bops. This ends up being the bridge to the song, and because she had previously posted this as a poem on Tumblr, people start accusing Halsey of stealing this bridge from the 17 Black Tumblr account. Her Tumblr account. 1975 fans were also not happy that the first verse seemed to very visibly describe Maddie Healy. Also, am I the only one who totally missed that Maddie Healy is a Nebo baby? Halsey wrote her best worst and most chaotic work about her relationship with Maddie Healy. In the song he supposedly wrote about her called She's American, he called her weird and vacant. The Audacity of Maddie Healy will just never end. But Halsey's early fame wasn't just controversial amongst Tumblr stan accounts. While Halsey was promoting Badlands, the New York Times quoted her as saying she identifies as tri-bi, bisexual, bipolar, and biracial. For some context, Halsey's dad is black, whereas her mother is white, and she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder at 17 after being hospitalized for an attempt. And since the start of her career, she's been very open about these aspects of her identity. But of course, the try-by header used by the New York Times got memed to death, and it is a label that still follows Halsey to this day. Halsey still is all of those things that, that didn't change about Halsey. She just doesn't call herself try-by for obvious reasons. Uh, Halsey claimed in an interview with the Rolling Stone later that she never actually called herself try-by, but that the try-by label did end up really trivializing her identity. She said, the funniest thing is that the biggest battle I've had to overcome in my career was not being bisexual, was not being biracial, was not being bipolar. It was everybody thinking that I was exploiting those things. She also expressed her disdain for being pigeonholed by the press. Being bisexual, being bipolar, being biracial. It's been used to define me, but I'm desperate to be indefinable. 
People took this try by name as just like the peak of Tumblr identity politics gone too far and essentially accused Halsey of tokenizing herself in different ways, particularly her identity as a half black woman because that is who she is, but she is a white passing woman. So her experiences are going to be different than other biracial people who are not white passing and don't have the privileges that come with that. And Halsey has never claimed that she does represent all biracial experiences or anything near that. In fact, she's been very open about her privileges as a white passing person. But there is this assumption that any public facing person of any kind of minority group must be this model image of that minority group. And especially if they're in between two identities, like a biracial person, they're meant to pick a side and that side is basically the side that people think you look most like. On one hand, some white people feel more comfortable talking to her about her race because they don't feel like I'm going to attack them or assume things, and that's a whole other problem in and of itself. On the other hand, she's not qualified to participate in every conversation about blackness, and she's okay with that. I recognize how fortunate I am for my complications and my struggle to be that I'm not black enough because not being black enough has never denied me anything in life. The shortfalls that I have amongst my own communities are negligible compared to the experiences that I could be having if I wasn't white passing. Halsey has also been very open about their sexual orientation and their gender identity long before they were famous. Halsey said they made a point of identifying and empowering their own sexuality ever since a time in high school where someone broke into her locker and spread around a topless photo she had in there that was intended for a boyfriend. Teachers saw it, everyone saw it, and suddenly I was not the weird girl, I was the slut. I could have recoiled and deflected my sexuality, but instead I was like, I'm gonna own it now. Lily was Halsey's first girlfriend when Halsey was 16. At the time, the two were camp counselors and had this whirlwind summer romance and then never spoke again. Halsey told their mother about Lily about this relationship and Halsey's mom said it was nothing to be ashamed of. Like a lot of queer people, Halsey has had their sexual orientation questioned for years. And again, with this try-by label, people have accused Halsey of using bisexuality just as a marketing ploy. To which Halsey has responded, people will say Halsey's pretending to be bisexual to get more album sales. I'm like, wow, goddamn, it's incredible that we live in a fucking year where being queer helps you sell records. Like, that's a pretty wild development in the music industry. Yeah, being queer does not give you a one-up in the music industry by any means, and Halsey does not have to prove their identities to anyone. What people maybe don't think about when they trivialize Halsey's identities or question Halsey's identities is that there are other people with these identities like Halsey, who have these experiences, who have these mental illnesses, who have these identities, they can see that, well, if you think that about Halsey, what do you think about me? It creates an environment where no one feels like they can talk about being biracial, having mental health issues, or being queer. Because everyone is also afraid of not being enough of a minority, of not being the acceptable form of whichever identity. In response to a BuzzFeed article which suggested Halsey was appearing more straight after becoming mainstream famous, Halsey said, sorry I'm not gay enough for you. Hire some analysis of my one year in the public eye and the ignorance of eight plus years of sexual discovery to determine if I'm truly queer. And it is part of a mentality so ingrained in the erasure of bisexual credibility, even within the LGBT community. Yeah, I mean, I am not a public figure on any level near Halsey, and I know how exhausting bi erasure or biphobia can be. And having that speculation about something so personal to you on such a huge scale, I mean, I'm exhausted just thinking about it, so I can truly only imagine. In 2015, Halsey gave one of her fans their first kiss. Uh, one issue, however, was that Halsey was 20 at the time and that fan was 15 years old. Now, that fan has spoken about this and said that this moment was really positive for her, and this kiss helped her realize that she was a lesbian. Also, in 2014, Halsey tweeted, I keep promising underage fans that I'm going to make out with them. I am so going to jail. I do remember both of these things happening and being discussed on Tumblr at the time, and of course people were critical of it, as they should be but it kind of flew under the mainstream radar until 2019 when Halsey ended up collabing with K-pop group BTS. You cannot hide your sins from the army. They will find them and they will get Halsey is over trending on Twitter. 
Halsey did end up deleting that tweet, but I couldn't find any public statement from them addressing either the tweet or the time they actually did kiss an underage fan. I've said it before and I'll say it again, can celebrities just stop kissing fans? regardless of age, even if the fan themselves is initiating it, you can avoid the wrath of the BTS army and no one's boundaries are crossed. A win for everyone. All right, content warning for this next portion, we are discussing miscarriage and you can skip to the next chapter if you don't want to hear about that. And just another warning, this is just a really difficult story. Halsey has endometriosis, which went undiagnosed for many years. And if you're not familiar, endometriosis is where tissue grows outside of the uterus, which causes, among other things, severe pelvic pain and, in some cases, infertility and an increased risk of pregnancy loss. Halsey suffered multiple miscarriages, one of which happened just four hours before she was scheduled to give a live performance on Vivo Lift. Because she is actively experiencing a medical emergency in her hotel room, she says, I have to cancel this show. And everyone around her is like, well, it's Vivo Lift. It's three million impressions. So she has her assistant buy adult diapers. She takes a Percocet and she performs. That was the moment of my life where I thought to myself, I don't feel like a fucking human being anymore. This thing, this music, Halsey, whatever it is that I'm doing, took precedence and priority over every decision that I made regarding this entire situation from the moment I found out until the moment it went wrong. A horrifying experience that did not even end there. Uh, she very bravely describes this experience in interviews, her struggles with chronic pain, with endometriosis, with the fear that she won't be able to become a mother when that's something that's very important to her. But in a paper magazine interview in 2017, she says that she regrets opening up about this moment in her life because some people responded very violently to her story. A lot of people were like, oh, you're lying. You had an abortion. I did a show in Toronto and a couple people came to the concert and held up a bunch of bloody baby dolls in the crowd. Those are the moments where I'm like, this is the one thing maybe I wish I kept myself, but I didn't and it's out there and I have to own it now and hopefully use it to help other people feel like they're not in a position where they're alone and feel like their life is gonna go on. After Roe v. Wade was overturned in 2022, and people in the United States lost the constitutional right to an abortion, Halsey one spoke publicly at her concert about her experience, but also released an essay describing the life-saving abortion she had after suffering another miscarriage. Many people have asked me since carrying a child to term after years of struggling to do so, if I have reconsidered my stance on abortion. The answer is firmly no. In fact, I have never felt more strongly about it. My abortion saved my life and gave way for my son to have his. Every person deserves the right to choose when, if, and how when they have this dangerous and life-altering experience. I will hold my son in one arm and fight with all my might with the other. Halsey has done a lot of interviews actually where they've spoken about their experiences with miscarriages, with endometriosis, and I'll put their essay in the description box because I do think it's an important conversation to have. I just try to keep descriptions of people's like absolute worst traumas brief on here because I'd hate to accidentally do them or anyone else affected by these experiences a disservice by misspeaking on the topic, but I also don't want to ignore it either. So just so you're aware, if you want to know more, it's out there. All right, you know me, get ready for a drastic tone change. In September of 2015, Halsey got into a a classic Twitter fight with Maggie Stiefvater. Maggie Stiefvater is an author of various fantasy YA novels, which were very popular with Tumblr fans. I was not previously familiar with this author's work, but in a Huffington Post article summarizing this Halsey drama, the author references a different scandal where Maggie was invited to speak on a panel about, in her words, writing about the other, um, the other being people of color. Uh, so I knew I was in for a mess. After the release of Badlands, some of Maggie's fans suggested that the song Drive was very reminiscent of the relationship between two of Maggie's characters. But according to Maggie, that was absolutely ridiculous because Halsey's song was about hand jobs and Maggie would never associate herself with such depravity. Uh, Halsey sees this and responds. Having thoroughly lost this Twitter battle, uh, Maggie tweets, I used at Halsey as a long running joke on my Twitter because I thought she'd never see it. It was like joking about, I don't know, Elvis. Elvis, 
hand jobs, same thing really. In February of 2016, several videos surfaced of Halsey having some not very pleasant interactions with fans. I'm so sorry. It's like not for nothing, but I'm getting a lot of really rude messages right now from people saying that I'm fucked up and I swerved you and I'm being rude and I'm being mean. Like not for nothing, but I've been impressed since eight o'clock in the morning. I have a whole day of interviews to do. I'm still doing them. I would never just walk by you and not meet you. So to abuse me like that online is kind of fucked up. I have a lot more interviews to do and I promise I'm going to meet people. But please don't be mean to me. I have a very busy day too, okay? So it really makes me upset. Please don't be mean to me. Dude, I could not be a pop star. If I was a pop star and made a deep dive on myself, because of course I would, uh, half the controversies would just be me publicly breaking down. And what makes this moment sadder is I don't think Halsey even addressed this moment. Halsey just quietly deactivated her Twitter account for some time. I think it goes without saying here that like lashing out like this at your fans even when you are getting a lot of rude messages, it's not all right. I also just think it's such like a human moment that I have a hard time being directly critical of it. In the summer of 2016, Pokemon Go sweeping the nation. Hillary Clinton is trying to get Americans to Pokemon Go to the polls. And Halsey just released the song of the summer, but actually with everyone's favorite Coles mannequins come to life, the Chainsmokers. This song was a hit with frat basements everywhere and is currently the sixth most streamed song on Spotify ever. This song was most definitely playing the night I met my now partner and I think that is actually the straightest fact about me. In August of 2016, the group performed this live at the 2016 MTV Video Music Awards. In this performance, Halsey is wearing a long brown bob, a lob, which is very different from their usual shaved head or pastel colors. This led to BuzzFeed writing an article about how now Halsey isn't acting bisexual anymore because they've gone mainstream, you know, because she like had brown hair one time. That's why I had to dye the bottom part of my hair, otherwise they'd take my bisexual license away. But BuzzFeed did not have to fear because Halsey would soon get into just the queerest Twitter fight they can possibly get into with their own collaborators, the Chainsmokers. What were they fighting about? Lady Gaga. <laughs> In an interview, the Chainsmokers said that they thought Lady Gaga's new single, Perfect Illusion, quote, sucked. Halsey tweeted, Lady Gaga is an icon and forever one of my greatest idols. I can't wait to see where her new era takes us. To which uh, chain smoker number two, Andrew Taggart tweeted, at Halsey, fuck you, you bald bitch. Taggart initially claimed that these images of these tweets were photoshopped, but he then changed his story to say that his account was hacked. The two did still perform together at the November AMAs and Halsey was that bald bitch at that performance. At least Buzzfeed could breathe a sigh of relief. <sighs> still bisexual. On June 2nd of 2017, Halsey released their second album, Hopeless Fountain Kingdom, which was a concept album based on the story of Romeo and Juliet, actually directly inspired by and kind of in collaboration with Baz Luhrmann. This album was also the first time Halsey used she, her pronouns to describe love interests in her song, Bad at Love, which was actually far and away the most successful song from this album and still one of their most popular songs to date. The album itself, while it did pretty well, it did end up selling less than half their previous records, Badlands, and it's not my favorite album from them either because I don't think it's bad. I just think it was probably like too mainstream poppy for a lot of the Tumblr audience Halsey had, but not memorable enough to really stick with mainstream audiences either. But on the Hopeless Fountain Kingdom album, Halsey collabed with Migos member Quavo. And this was controversial because several months before the song had been released, in February of 2017, Quavo made some uh, homophobic comments. In response to another rapper coming out as gay and fans generally having a positive response, Quavo said, they supported him and suggested that this guy coming out as gay undermined his brand because he went big by talking about trapping and selling Molly. That's whack, bro. So an interviewer for The Guardian asked how Halsey, a bisexual person and an LGBT advocate, could collaborate with someone who had made such openly homophobic comments. And Halsey said, 
I think he's misunderstood. Just because I choose to be a socially conscious artist, and I'm pretty good at it, that doesn't mean every artist is going to be equipped to be politically correct. I don't think he's inherently homophobic. I think he's in a tough place of trying to explain what he means. I agree his apology was bullshit, but I can't police everybody. Then that interviewer points out, well, Halsey, you certainly can police who appears on your album. And Halsey responds by just throwing some strays at Iggy Azalea. Yes, I can. And there's a lot of people I wouldn't put on my record. Iggy Azalea? Absolutely not. She had a complete disregard for black culture. Fucking moron. I watched her career dissolve and it fascinated me. I'm not a fan of Iggy Azalea personally, like either, but this <laughs> the deflection here is wild. It fascinated me. <laughs> This did not go over well on Twitter, where the only thing worse than being a bigot, of course, is being a hypocrite. And so Halsey did um, backtrack or kind of rephrase her comments by saying she didn't know that Quavo had made homophobic comments when I collaborated with him. And as far as homophobic people are concerned, she claimed it was everyone's responsibility to educate them, adding, I try to be understanding, and I'm truly sorry for my misjudgment. Now, this brings up what I feel is just a constant discussion around Halsey's career. Halsey has always been very outspoken about a variety of political issues and social issues, from racism to homophobia, and throughout the years, Halsey has, at times, had takes like this, which seem to just conflict with their progressive political values or the standard they try to normally hold themselves to. And so there's this group of people who straight up don't like Halsey being vocally progressive because they don't agree with those views or they don't like politics being brought up all the time. And then there's another group of people who at least say they don't mind that Halsey is a social justice advocate, but they focus on these moments where Halsey just has kind of a a bad take and concludes that Halsey is insincere, phony, a hypocrite, that she doesn't actually care about these things she claims to care about. And I don't want to discount people who sincerely don't like Halsey's hypocrisy. Just like the example I just gave, there are moments where Halsey's activism warrants criticism. But I do think at times this instinct to say, oh, Halsey's a poser, Halsey's a hypocrite, it's just like a repackaged way to say that we don't like Halsey expressing progressive ideals, period. I mean, this isn't just a Halsey thing. A fair amount of conservative media really harps on these like gotcha moments, which set out to prove that, see, you don't really care about that social issue with like the quiet conclusion being, so no one should care about these social issues. And so while again, there are moments where Halsey warrants criticism, I do just want to caution people against discounting all of Halsey's values or beliefs just because they had a bad take every once in a while. Perhaps this is a conversation better suited to a more serious video essay and not just all the drama Halsey has been through throughout the years. But again, I just felt like this was a footnote that had to be included. Like, like everything, it's a nuanced conversation in an online space where nuance just uh, it's not really a thing people tend to focus on. Perhaps her most infamous, iconic maybe, relationship? Halsey's on-again, off-again relationship with g Easy from 2017 to 2018. On August 30th of 2017, Halsey made a surprise appearance at g Easy's concerts where they performed their new song, him and I. And the song has some pretty intense lyrics, including g Easy saying, Ever catch me cheating, she would try to cut me. Ha, ha, ha. This performance immediately sparked dating rumors, but g Easy assured the media that this was nothing but professional admiration. After all, he's 28, and he simply admired the then 22-year-old Halsey's uh, artistic gifts. But the next day, Halsey tweeted out photos of the performance with the caption, Thanks, Bud Light, and thank you, baby. So, uh, Whoops! They quickly give up on keeping their relationship private or pretending that they're not dating and are spotted absolutely everywhere together. They're at events together. They're posting pictures together. Those are the two scenarios you tend to see celebrities together. All two of them. They're doing it. g Easy described their relationship as Bonnie and Clyde, Romeo and Juliet. Meanwhile, Halsey, in an interview, jokingly says that she got bamboozled into dating him. Did you like him at first? Because I was reading some articles like, ah, you weren't really feeling him at first. Did I make that up? He was just, he was just really persistent. He was really persistent. He really wanted to hang out and really wanted me to like him a lot. And it took me a while to be like, 
Oh, fine, okay, I like you back. Gavin. Yeah, and I'm glad I did. That's I got bamboozled though a little bit. I think I got tricked into it. <laughs> well, yeah. Halsey, great to see you as always. So already we've got some very healthy relationship dynamics going on here. These two are very public, constantly posting PDA until Halsey makes this announcement on her Instagram story. Normally keep this kind of thing private, but provided our public nature, I feel I need to inform my fans. GEZ and I are taking some time apart. I'm eager to continue the upcoming passage of time, dedicating myself to my art and career and the duration of my tour. I wish him the best. At the time, there were rumors that Halsey was caught cheating on G-Eazy with Megan Machine Gun Kelly. MGK and G-Eazy do get into some Twitter beef, but that's just like dudes being dudes. We don't have to talk about that. <laughs> But on July 4th of 2018, Halsey tweets and quickly deletes the scissors emoji, which people suspect is a reference to the him and I lyric. g -Eazy is also spotted out with Demi Lovato, leading some to think that g -Eazy may have been cheating on Halsey with Demi Lovato, but I think that rumor gets pretty quickly debunked. Shortly after, Halsey also is seen crying while performing her song Sorry at the Common Ground Music Festival. After the festival, she says, I learned recently it's okay to be alone. Being alone is enough. The second lesson I learned is don't sleep with your ex. But don't worry about all that because in September of 2018, we get another hard launch of Halsey and g -Eazy. They're back. They're better than ever. Nothing is going to go horribly wrong in a matter of six weeks. Halsey releases their new song, Without Me, which is pretty wild because this was not a single for an album. Halsey was actually actively touring at this time and just decided that this was a song that they needed to write and immediately record and release. This was actually their first solo song to hit number one on the Billboard Hot 100. Halsey says this song is about multiple relationships, including g -Eazy, and how they tend to build people up who don't reciprocate that support. They talk more about their relationship with g -Eazy in this one interview with Zach Sang, and there are again some not so subtle hints that this is just a pretty unhealthy relationship. We put so much pressure on ourselves, and the thing that's crazy about that is that, you know, we obviously have such a strong connection because we're two of, of very few people who feel like we can actually relate to each other and like really relate to each other. And it's like, you understand me, you know? But because of that, we take a lot of out on each other because we know we're the only ones who can. So, you know, if we have a long day and he can't yell at his manager or yell at you know, someone who gave him a hard time or yell at the person who packed his schedule unrealistically, inhumanely. He calls you. But he yells at me. <laughs> but it, it, and I yell at him. But it's because we know, it's it's almost because we love each other so much. It's almost like, I know I, can, I can't take this out on anyone else, and I'm going to take it on you right now because I know, A, you understand, and B, you're not going anywhere. That's it. Yeah. And you the know foundation what I mean? of love is so strong yeah. and understanding. It's like, I need to yell right now, so I'm picking you mm -hmm. because you're not going anywhere. <laughs> that's a, 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 a yelling, obviously, not the best thing, but that's yeah. a special thing to share with somebody. Yeah, we just have to figure out how to do it the healthy way. Right. You know? Yeah. But then on October 24th of 2018, Halsey posts a series of tweets which seem to hint that they have broken up once again. Then in 2019, Halsey performs her song Without Me on SNL with a performance background that just absolutely exposes g -Eazy. The largest words say, I'm so sorry, Ashley, I cheated. And the rest of the wall lists all of the places he supposedly cheated. Minneapolis, Austin, at home and in more places that I can't even remember. But this isn't the end either. In February of 2020, at one of Halsey's concert, a fan keeps shouting g Easy's name during her performance. And Halsey rightfully lets this person have it. And you were drunk, uh, if you say g Easy one more fucking time, I'll kick you outside. She later posts on her Instagram story, don't ever let someone make you feel crazy or unhinged because you're a woman standing up for yourself. Don't tolerate disrespect in the name of being nice. Love you. The slipper incident. These are the kind of scandals I just absolutely eat up. In February of 2018, Halsey is papped outside of Paramount Studios with her assistant laying down blue slippers for Halsey to slide on as she gets out of her car. 
love it. But the haters over at Metro published this article. Pop star Halsey receives the full diva treatment as assistant helps her put on her slippers. I mean, the absolute audacity. Millennials have gone too far. This is why we can't have houses. After these pictures went viral on where else Twitter, Halsey came forward to address the controversy. TBH, I was hungover and had to shoot a TV show first thing in the morning. I only had my stiletto heels from the night before. She was just being a real one. Hashtag women supporting women. I don't know if I'd call your paid employee laying down slippers for you women supporting women, but hey, if the worst thing you're doing with your money as a wealthy person is, you know, paying someone to put slippers on you, go off, I guess. In 2019, Halsey started dating Evan Peters of American Horror Story fame. And this was kind of an iconic moment because Halsey famously was a Tumblr girly, and they had previously tweeted, Seriously, Evan Peters, stop making me attracted to alleged sociopaths and accused murderers. Petition for Evan Peters to date me. Stars, they're just like us. But unfortunately, this story uh, takes a very serious pivot. In June of 2020, during the BLM protests, Halsey was seen at several protests. They were seen providing medical assistance to those in the crowd who had been hit with rubber bullets or were tear gassed. And at this time, Halsey was very outspoken about her privileges as a white passing biracial woman, and she launched the Black Creators Fund. Meanwhile, Evan Peters retweeted, I can watch these piece of shit looters get tackled all day. Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, did not know that that happened. I missed that tweet. Halsey did not respond directly to this tweet, but one fan did respond to Evan Peters saying, is this why Halsey broke up with you? and Halsey liked that tweet. On January 17th of 2020, Halsey released Manic, which, unlike their previous work, was not a concept album. This album was about Ashley and not the Halsey persona. Basically, the album was meant to center around more of the personal experiences they had had throughout their life, and this featured the hit song Without Me. It also had some crazy collabs like Alanis Morissette, Suga from BTS, Juice World. One of the songs samples a scene from Jennifer's Body, the criminally underrated Megan Fox and Amanda Seyfried movie. I think watching clips of that movie on YouTube is just a universal queer experience. Pitchfork, as it does, released its review of the new album, Manic, giving the album only a 6.5 out of 10. And may I just say, Pitchfork, famous for some just absolute L takes when it comes to their reviews. Let me read some of their ratings to you. Because the Internet by Childish Gambino, 5.8. Mr. Morale, The Big Steps by Kendrick Lamar, 7.6. Taylor Swift Fearless, Taylor's version, 7.5. Taylor Swift Fearless Original, 8.1. Actually, all of the Taylor re-releases are ranked lower than the original albums, despite Pitchfork acknowledging in their reviews that her voice is more polished and it's a much better produced version. And Pitchfork is also not known for being the kindest in their criticism when they rate albums. They did not hold back on Halsey. Pitchfork described Manic as almost too irritating to endure, and the kind of amorphous chameleonic pop I've come to associate with sitting miserably in the backseat of a lift. Halsey responds to this review by tweeting, can the basement that they run Pitchfork out of just collapse already? Great, zing, got him. Except it, it turns out that Pitchfork is based in the One World Trade Center, which, assuming you did not forget already, um, has already collapsed once before. And because these snowflakes can't ha handle Halsey calling for a second 9-11, she deletes this tweet and clarifies, was just trying to make a joke, intended zero harm, just figured I could poke at them back with the same aloof passive aggression they poke at artists with, clearly a misunderstanding. Don't let the woke mob censor you, Halsey. <laughs> Say what you mean. <laughs> Listen, I highly doubt that they knew where Pitchfork was. I mean, It'd be pretty crazy if Halsey did know. But even setting aside the 9-11 issue, that that sounds wild saying out loud. Even even setting that aside, as annoying as I personally find Pitchfork, there is also probably an ethical concern about artists publicly calling out journalists reviewing their work. Like, yes, the article was mean, but when a major artist calls out a random journalist, they are inevitably sending their fans after that one not-so-public figure, and you have to consider whether that's warranted each time. 
What? He's getting riled up about the 9-11 tweet. I don't even know. Goose did not forget. For this next story, there is also a great write-up with much more detail on the hobby drama subreddit by Momo Official, and I'll be linking their write-up down below. In 2020, Halsey was still under the label Astral Works, which is owned by Universal Music Group, as many labels are because capitalism breeds innovation or whatever. Universal Music Group is a huge conglomeration of thousands of artists, but there have been several UMG merch roles outs which have been problematic in the past. Artists like Taylor Swift and Ariana Grande uh, had noticeable drops in merch quality in the years of like 2018 to 2019. And this was supposedly because all UMG artists under these various record labels all had their merch created by one merch distribution center, which was not very good. In September of 2019, Halsey live streams themselves painting the cover of her own album. And this painting is crazy. I knew Halsey was artsy, but goddamn. This also serves as a launch for merch pre-orders. There are various, <laughs> there are various tie-dye items, a, a Dickies collab, and an online exclusive glitter vinyl. In December of 2019, Halsey announces a flash sale on their website where all physical copies of Manic purchased during this time will be signed by Halsey. And when the album launches in January of 2020, Halsey announces another flash sale on a different merch site. This time they're selling a Manic themed candle, another signed Manic CD, except this time it is being signed by Ashley not Halsey. There's also like a manic coloring book, another sweatsuit, lots, lots of other little goodies. In February of 2020, the initial merch, which people had, you know, ordered in September, finally starts being delivered to some fans, and the quality is just terrible. The beanie is misshapen, the crew necks are noticeably cheaper looking than those originally advertised on the website, plus items like the $70 Dickies are absolutely nowhere to be seen. I can't control them. In a group chat with fans, Halsey says that the merch is not up to their standard and that they're going to fix it. Halsey's merch team also sends a mass email to those who bought the marble crew neck and tie-dye hoodie, promising to remake and send replacement items, but only to those who respond to that email uh, within the month. But the thing is, a lot of people still have not received their items yet. So they don't know if they have like a dud item yet or if they should like request a replacement if they haven't received it yet. And also it's a pretty short period of time to respond if they want a replacement when the company is acknowledging that the product is not good quality. Fans also start receiving their signed Halsey CDs, and they notice that the signatures are suspiciously consistent from product to product, and fans suspect that these are auto-penned, meaning a machine copied Halsey's signature en masse and Halsey didn't individually sign all of these albums. After this controversy blew up amongst Halsey fans, later copies of the Manic CDs that were sent out appeared to have more natural variety which you would expect, which led some to believe that Halsey's team had caught wind of the auto pen scandal and had pushed Halsey to sign more of the CDs. Which also meant the shipment was being further delayed because Halsey needed to physically sign more and more. In March of 2020, the glitter vinyl, which was originally up for sale in September of 2019, was quietly changed on the pre-order website. Instead of glitter actually being pressed into the vinyl, it was just like a really cheap overlay of a glitter sticker over a black vinyl. Significantly uglier than the product fans had already pre-ordered and paid for. UMG responds to fans upset about this and said basically they couldn't figure out how to make a glitter vinyl without sacrificing quality and that they think that this is good enough and close enough to what fans pre-ordered, but also we were getting into June of 2020 and fans who had pre-ordered in September of 2019 still had not received these vinyls ugly or not. And the rest of the merch rollout was not going any better. Merch still not being delivered on time and was wildly inconsistent in quality. And of course, by this time, the pandemic had started, so there were various shipping and quality delays attributed to that. In July of 2020, Halsey announced that they were releasing a poetry book, which fans were not thrilled about considering many had already spent hundreds supporting Halsey's merch drops with poor or no return, so they weren't exactly lining up to buy another thing from Halsey right now. Halsey's manager clarified that this poetry book would be coming from Amazon and Barnes and Nobles and from a reputable book publishing company and quote, 
not the terrible capital U music merch company who has been fired upon sending the final vinyls and will not work with Halsey again. And that was that. The writer of the hobby drama subreddit post stated that she was comped an exclusive staff-only sweatsuit by Halsey's team after tweeting about how she still had not received several merch products. And she did update that she at least got some of her merch, but it's unclear if the vinyl or crew neck ever made it to them or what the quality of that merch was. Also, you know that I ordered Halsey's poetry book, but it hasn't come in the mail yet, so I'll probably just cut to me wearing different clothes right about now. Hello, tis I. I am back now having read Halsey's poetry, and honestly, I was disappointed, but only for the most toxic of reasons. It was not bad. It just was good enough to where I feel like I don't have a lot of really revolutionary thoughts about the subject. But first of all, I believe Halsey did the artwork on the cover, and this is by far the most beautiful celebrity book I've had to purchase for this channel. Like, I'm very happy I'm gonna get to put this on my bookcase afterwards. And as I've gone through this video, I've seen a lot of Halsey artwork at this point, and they are very talented. And as I was looking at this cover, and as I was looking through some of the art they've done, just in their concerts, like live on stage. There's no artwork throughout this poetry book, and not to say that poetry books have to have artwork, but I just think that like, since Halsey very clearly has like a visual eye, I think it could have enhanced a lot of the poems in here if they had put their artwork in here. And also I will say this book took me longer to get through than I thought, and some of the poetries are long and I think that they're worth reading through and taking that time. Other poems I feel like could have been cut, and I think if you had artwork to sort of pad out this book rather than some of these poems, it would have been a better experience and the book would have still been, you know, about this size. That being said, this is miles above Bella Thorne's poetry book, which I've had to read for this channel, and I'm no poet aficionado by any means, but I enjoyed reading it. And I think if you're a Halsey fan, or if you've been through some of the experiences that Halsey has been through and that Halsey discusses in this book, I think you'll, you'll get a lot out of it. So just in case you are thinking about reading it, Halsey does talk about a lot of serious topics in here. Halsey talks about their childhood, their queer identity. They also talk about abortion, sexual assault, like very serious things. The poem that Halsey read at the Women's March that went viral a few years ago is also in here. And you can just see that these poems were written with purpose, that they were edited, that some thought was put into it. And it doesn't read like a celebrity just trying to fill 150 pages of a poetry book. So here's an example of one of the stronger poems from the book. Due date. I was born five weeks early. I couldn't wait to join the rest of the world. And that is exactly the moment my enthusiasm ceased. The nurses tried to take me so my mother could sleep, but she refused to let me go. I'm sure ultimately I ended up in a common room for newborns. And I'm sure ultimately I lay there comparing myself to the other babies, wondering if I were as smart as they were or as funny or as beautiful. The average baby weighs eight pounds. I weigh five. The average baby is 20 inches long. I was 14. And it was on my first day on earth that I realized I didn't measure up and I never would. I feel like this poem is probably most emblematic of my general feelings about this book. I think the intro is very strong, and I think the ending is very strong, and there are just some bits in the middle that I feel like just don't really add anything, no need to be there, but it's also like not outright bad either. Just cut it a little bit. And this is again where I think if they had artwork accompanying their poetry, they wouldn't have felt the need to make some of these poems as long as they were. But there are some longer poems I really like. There's one Halsey reads on Dax Shepard's podcast called The Mailman, and that one is two pages long, and I really liked that one too. I don't want it to seem like just like TikTok has rotted my attention span and I just can't pay attention to a poem that's two pages long. It's not so much the length itself of these poems, it's just like there are stanzas that are clearly much stronger than the rest, and not everything needs to be in there if they're not all of like equal strength, you know what I mean? Of course, this here is not an in-depth review, and I don't think it can be because this video is like over an hour long, we gotta move things along. But in case you want to see some more in-depth reviews on this book, I will link Rachel Oates and Carly Thorne's videos down below. Both of them great creators, but also just much better at speaking about poetry than I personally am. Or, you know, just give it a read because I learned some things about Halsey reading through it, and there's some enjoyable poetry in there. Doesn't make for a funny haha cynical YouTube bit, but I would say like a 7 out of 10 
experience. But anyways, back to me from an earlier point in time. In February of 2021, Halsey launched her makeup line about face. Listen, I know we're all exhausted with celebrity makeup lines and Halsey fully acknowledges in interviews that she kind of missed the boat on like celebrity makeup brands as a trend. But when those were first starting out, Halsey said that she wasn't big enough to warrant having their own brand. I mentioned at the beginning that Halsey did all of their own makeup at the beginning of their career. They still do their own makeup for every photo shoot event, all of their album covers, their magazine covers, like everything to this day. In the interviews she's done promoting the brand, it really does seem like Halsey is a makeup lover, which is like who you want to be the face of a brand. Also, if you're going to watch a Halsey interview, watch the one with her and Manny MUA. Of all the videos I watched, that's really the one that made me a Halsey stan. It's called Ripe and Ready. Um. <laughs> that sounds shocking. <laughs> so. Oh, gonna, oh my fucking god. <laughs> well, like, you would think this is my first fucking day. Mm? And we are here, and we are queer. We are. <laughs> like, like if you is... couldn't tell. <laughs> You're like, mm, and I'm like. Couldn't tell. Oh, what did you say for you? I look so small. I look so small. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, my little daintiness? <laughs> I haven't tried the products personally, so I can't really give a full review, but from what I can see grading on the scale of celebrity makeup brands, this does feel like a brand that's very true to Halsey's personal aesthetic, and it does at least feel unique. The brand was made in collaboration with the creators of Hard Candy, which as a drugstore makeup aficionado of the 2010s, Hard Candy was that girl. Their products were cheap, and for a while they were like the only drugstore brand that ever did like colors or glitter or anything besides like boring neutrals and that theme carries over to about face. The brand didn't launch with complexion products and the main focus is on colorful eye paints, pigments, glitter. I think the packaging is pretty unique and I also really appreciate that if you look at about face's Instagram feed, there's people across the gender spectrum modeling their products and it does seem like it's a brand that's marketed to genderqueer and non-binary individuals, which is like a rare thing to see. I really do think that if this line had come out even a year or two before it actually did, it would have been a much bigger well-known brand. So About Face is somewhere between like the lower to middle tier ultra price range. I would say it's kind of like NYX products level. Like lip paints and eye paints are $16 and their blush is $18. And you can definitely find stuff that's cheaper. But honestly, with the color range that they have, like there's probably not a ton that's cheaper than what they have. And Halsey said that the price range was also a very conscious choice because they went through a time in their life when they were unhoused, struggled financially, and they didn't want to price gouge fans who were in a similar position. And to that end, Halsey actually has another makeup line that I had no idea even existed called AF94. This brand has a very similar Y2K aesthetic, but everything on AF94 is $10 or below. And I just think that's really cool. Other than Millie Bobby Brown's makeup line or like Drew Barrymore's makeup line back in the day, there's not a lot of drugstore priced celebrity brands. So I'll say it. I mean, I haven't tried it yet. So maybe all the products are awful, but I feel like Halsey's makeup line has some potential. It seems like it's underappreciated. On August 27th of 2021, Halsey released their coolest album yet, If I Can't Have Love, I Want Power. This album has a totally different sound from their previous work and is much more of an alternative rock grunge album even. But beyond that, this album is about the joys and horrors of pregnancy and childbirth. It was very important to Halsey that the cover art conveyed the sentiment of their journey over the past few months, the dichotomy of the Madonna and the whore, the idea that Halsey as a sexual being and their body as a vessel and a gift to their child are two concepts that can coexist peacefully and powerfully. Halsey's body has belonged to the world in many different ways the past few years, and this image is Halsey's means of reclaiming their autonomy and establishing their pride and strength as a life force for their human being. This album really wasn't promoted or like marketed at all. And so I think it kind of flew under the radar, but it obviously didn't fly under the radar that much because it was the first album of Halsey's to receive a Grammy nomination. And its themes of female autonomy and pregnancy and motherhood have only grown to be more relevant as access to healthcare and gender care has only become a more divisive and relevant issue in the US. Also in 2021, it was announced that Halsey would co-star in and co-executive produce an HBO miniseries the Players' Table with Sydney Sweeney. This is based on the book They Wish They Were Us and is about a murder in an affluent town, an HBO concept we've never seen before. I say this as if I wouldn't have absolutely 
eaten that up. There's never been confirmation that this was canceled, but after these past two years of HBO Max just burying its own reputation and, you know, Hollywood refusing to pay writers and actors their fair share, it doesn't seem like this show is coming anytime soon. But hey, maybe I'll be wrong and you'll all come back to comment on this video years later, telling everyone what an absolute fool I was to doubt the great HBO Max. Sorry, Max. In May of 2022, Halsey uh, started a war with her record label, and by that I mean she posted a TikTok with her unreleased song. So this post quickly starts going viral and fans are saying, don't worry, Halsey, we'll make the song go viral for you. We'll show that record label that you don't need a viral moment to release this song. I remember when this was all going down and I genuinely could not tell if Halsey was just playing some sort of 4D chess with all of us because they were complaining about needing to make a TikTok with their music while making a TikTok with their music, which was perfectly engineered to drive just a ton of engagement, either in support of Halsey or against Halsey. And I was not the only one with this thought. Someone commented that this is a viral marketing video, and Halsey replied, bruh, I wish it was, haha, <laughs> they just said I have to post TikToks, they didn't specifically say about what, so here I am, crying emoji, smiling emoji. Was it reverse psychology or reverse reverse psychology? Who knows? But it is worth noting that just under a year later, Halsey did end up leaving Capitol Records after eight years of being with them. So who knows? Maybe the music label drama was real. On June 9th of 2022, Halsey was sued by a former nanny who alleged violations of California labor law and disability discrimination. According to the plaintiff, Halsey forced the nanny to work around the clock on consecutive days with little to no rest, did not pay sufficient overtime, and allegedly fired the nanny after the nanny requested time off for medical issues. According to the complaint, plaintiff sent defendant a text message informing defendants that plaintiff may need to undergo a medical procedure that would require her to take a leave of absence from work. A few days later, without any warning or response to plaintiff's text message, defendants responded by terminating plaintiff. Halsey outright denied these allegations, and their rep issued this statement to Entertainment Tonight. These allegations are baseless. This individual's employment was recently terminated in response to specific incidents in which Halsey's infant was left unsupervised in an unsafe location while under the nanny's care, and it was discovered that the nanny was intoxicated while the child was in her care. Furthermore, at no time during this individual's term of employment with Halsey were any complaints raised. Consequently, while Halsey is both saddened and disappointed by this turn of events, they feel it's important to refute these allegations publicly as they take ableism and ethical working conditions very seriously. Halsey wants to be absolutely clear that they remain a vocal advocate both against ableism and for ethical working conditions. I was able to find the court docket for this, and it looks like as of May 2023, there was a conference to discuss trial preparation, and unless there's a settlement before that, that, which, you know, there may be, we might actually get a trial on this. Also, I just realized that the nanny and Halsey are both named Ashley. Why can't we, as Ashleys, support other Ashleys, you know? And that is all I have for today. My camera is about to overheat and the battery's about to die, so I'll keep this as brief as I can. If you want to see more content from me, I am uploading new bonus content every month on my Patreon, if you want to go support me on there. I am also live on Twitch every Tuesday and Thursday nights from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Or if you don't want to do any of those things, that's cool. If you liked this video, feel free to like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see y'all in the next one. Bye. Uh, but what do you want to be feeling at the end of it all? What, what do you want to be feeling on your deathbed? On my deathbed. Um, wow. I don't know, probably memory foam. Memory foam? I have a spring mattress right now, and um, I don't really like it very much. So, I'd imagine I'd want to be comfortable. Okay. <laughs>